peace, salafia, shalom, assalamu alaikum. To know thyself is to know thy history. And in this series, we'll be discussing the connection between Sierra Leone and Nigeria. Have you ever wondered why some Sierra Leoneans have Nigerian first names or why Creole has Nigerian words in it? Have you thought about why there are some Nigerians with English surnames and why Nigerian pigeon sounds like Sierra Leonean Creole? I'm sure by now you know that this is no coincidence. And what if I told you that the Creole people of Sierra Leone and the Yoruba of Nigeria share a common ancestry and story? This story begins with the liberated Africans of Sierra Leone. The British slave trade ended in all of its colonies in the year 1807. But this did not stop countries like Spain and Portugal from still making illegal slave raids on liberated or native blacks in the British colonies. In 1808, Following the British declaring the abolition of slavery, they would form the West African Squadron. Their role was to suppress the Atlantic slave trade by patrolling the coast of West Africa. This was successful to a large degree because they were able to intercept a large percentage of slave ships that raided the coast and attempted to transport them to places like Cuba and Brazil. The liberated Africans were Yoruba and Hausa predominantly, along with the Igbo, Efik, Bantu, and Akan to a smaller degree. They were rescued by the squadron from being transported across the Atlantic. These recaptives were resettled in Sierra Leone and would be known as liberated Africans before they assimilated into the other settler groups to form the Creole culture. All illegally enslaved Africans liberated by the Royal Navy were taken to Freetown, where Admiralty courts legally confirmed their free status. They would take on apprenticeships from the Nova Scotian settlers and the Jamaican Maroons upon being resettled into Sierra Leone. More than 80,000 Africans rescued from the illegal trade between Africa and the Americas were emancipated before courts operating in Freetown between 1808 and 1871 when the last remaining mixed commission was closed. The ships that weren't successfully intercepted would take the full voyage to Brazil and Cuba. While enslaved in Brazil, the Hausa and Yoruba of Bahia would start an insurrection on Sunday during Ramadan in January 1835, which would come to be known as the Mali Revolt. The Hausa were already culturally Muslims, and the Yoruba were adherents of the Ifa traditional religion in southwest Nigeria and Benin. There was a percentage of Yoruba groups who had been converted to Islam by traders from Mali in the 14th and 15th century. These Yoruba Muslims would refer to Islam as Isan Imale, which possibly translates to religion of the Malayans or the hard religion. So during enslavement in Brazil, the Yoruba Muslims were referred to as Imale, hence why the insurrection was called the Mali Revolt. The revolt was unsuccessful. The Hausa and Yoruba were not able to physically defeat their Brazilian masters, but mentally they terrorized them into a state of paranoia, fear, and a surge of anxiety that made day-to-day -day life uneasy for the Brazilians. The Brazilian authorities began to worry that the slaves would keep on revolting and follow the example of the African rebels in the Haitian Revolution. So after the Mali Revolt, authorities quickly sentenced four of the rebels to death, 16 to prison, 8 to forced labor, and 45 to flogging. 200 of the surviving leaders of the revolt were then deported by municipal authorities back to Africa. They would be deported to the countries of Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Benin, and Ghana. But for now, we will focus on those sent to Sierra Leone and Nigeria. Those who were resettled in Sierra Leone would join the liberated Africans who were already settled there after being successfully rescued by the British West African Squadron. When both groups of liberated Africans were resettled in Sierra Leone, a number of villages were established to provide accommodations for these new residents. And the name of these villages would be known as Leicester, formed in 1809. Wilberforce, formerly known as Cabenda, formed in 1810. Regent, formerly known as Hogbrook, formed in 1812. Gloucester, formed in 1814. Gisi, formed in 1816. Bathurst, formerly known as Leopoldtown, formed in 1817. 
Charlotte, formed in 1817. Hastings, Waterloo, and Wellington would form in 1819, and then Murraytown and Aberdeen would both form in 1829. In 1835, the liberated Africans from Brazil and Cuba, who were sent directly back to Nigeria, were referred to as Aguda to identify the Brazilian returnees, or Amaro to identify the Cuban returnees. In Lagos, they were given the watery terrains of Popo Aguda as their settlement. Most were Catholics, some still practiced the Ifa traditional religion, and some of the Agudas are also Muslims but most of them returned with Portuguese names that their descendants still carry on to this day. Some common Portuguese family names in Nigeria include Pinheiro, Da Severa, De Silva, De Sosa, and Moreira. The Agudas were aware of their home cities, but preferred to set up shop in Lagos because of ongoing wars in the interior. It was also conducive for trade and they were warmly received in Badagri. A ship of Agudas docking in Badagri would be welcomed by crowds of children, hailing them as they disembarked from the ship, whereas the hinterland strangers were viewed with suspicion. Oba Adrulade of Lagos was known to grant them land to build a house and provide men to assist them in their transition into local life. The elder returnees were comfortable, but many of the children were foreign to Lagos. They held on to the elements of Bahia culture from Brazil, such as Catholicism, and formed a close-knit community within Lagos Island. Popo Aguda was also a commercial center of trade, serving as a distribution center for imported goods. Its chief, the Onipopo, today presides over various ceremonies of remembrance that take place in the Brazilian quarters. The Cuban returnees were predominantly settled in Campo Square, which was named after an Amaro returnee named Hilario Campos. After slavery was abolished in Cuba and Brazil in 1886 and 88 respectively, further migration to Lagos continued. In the 1840s, the liberated Africans of Sierra Leone would join the Agudas and Amaros in Nigeria and would begin migrating there for cultural, missionary, and economic purposes. Many of them were already of Egbe and Oyo heritage and were children of Nigerians who were illegally captured but had their ships intercepted then resettled in Sierra Leone. Some were administrative personnel who were reassigned to Lagos. An expedition of the River Niger by Ajayi Crowther furthered the evangelical interest of many Sierra Leoneans towards Nigeria, and many of them would join the missionaries in this effort. They would primarily reside in the Lagos colony of Beokuta, Ibadan, Calabar, and Port Harcourt in the Niger Delta region. These Sierra Leonean Nigerians would become locally known as the Saro people. They were generally focused on trade and rose to become commercial middlemen between residents of Nigerian cities of Lagos, of Beokuta, and the Sierra Leonean capital of Freetown. In Lagos, the Saro would primarily reside in Abutemeta, Oluogbowo, and Yaba as primary settlements. Mostly of Egbe heritage, they established a few of the oldest churches in Lagos and also expanded the missionary work of the British in Nigeria. The Saro would also emerge as a dominant commercial group in Lagos. Having developed a migratory forte, they had an edge as travelers who were able to go into the interiors to meet directly with various commodity producers and traders. They were pioneers in the southern Nigerian trade of cola a cash crop that later emerged as a viable important export commodity for the western region in the early 20th century. The Saro introduced the crop which was brought from the house of traders from across the Niger River into southern Nigerian agriculture. The first cola farm and the dominant trading firm in cola were both orchestrated by Saros. Their owner, Mohamed Shitabe, was himself a Saro from the Yoruba Muslim community. The Saros also did not drop their yearning for Western education as they dominated the ranks of professions open to Africans. They were frequently known as lawyers, doctors, and civil servants. From 1850 to 1867, there would be disputes between the Saros and the local people of Lagos and Abeokuta. This would lead to their expulsion from the regions, 
The first disputes would occur in Lagos during the 1850s, which would lead to a temporary displacement of sorrows from the community, but would later be allowed to return. In 1867, there was a great tension between the Christian community and the adherents of the traditional religion of Abel Kuta. The Agbays were protesting the increasing influence of Western culture and the land encroachment led by the Lagos governor, known as John Howley Glover. The conflict was between the Egbays and the Europeans, but the sorrows would become collateral damage because the sorrow were very westernized culturally, politically and religiously, and this would offend and sometimes affect interactions between them and the native populations. The Egbays would decide to go on a rampage and damage European symbols such as churches and missions. A few sorrows were also expelled from Egbe land, but like the case of Lagos, peace was quickly restored. But the unrest in Obeokuta would lead to an exodus of its victims to Lagos. The sorrow of Lagos were eventually able to return after things calmed down, but the sorrow from Obeokuta, who were a westernized minority of the Egbe, no longer felt secure even after the conflict settled, so they requested to be resettled to Lagos as well. The European missionaries would ask the King of Lagos if it was possible for him to allocate any available land to the sorrow from Abeokuta. In response, the King said that Lagos Island was already filled up and he couldn't afford to give the little available land to them. Instead, he suggested that the governor contact the King's brother, Alato. His brother was the king of a territory located just across the lagoon. The governor made the same request to Alato and it was granted. He agreed to give the Sorrows a large tract of land from present-day Coach Street to somewhere just before the lands of Yaba, around Glover Street, where LSDPC estate was later built about 130 years later. These Sorrows of the Egbe community would form a settlement in Lagos called Ago Egbe, which means Egbe Camp in Yoruba. In the Niger Delta region, it was a little bit different from Lagos and Western Nigeria where the Yorubas were dominant. The Delta was more diverse and had various ethnic groups of equal political footing. The sorrows of the Delta region would settle primarily in Port Harcourt. Port Harcourt was founded by British authorities in 1913 as a coastal center for the export of palm oil and coal. A number of immigrants from Yoruba land, the House Estates, Gambia and Sierra Leone soon came to the city to work. Some of the sorrow were also clergymen and others were transferred for administrative duty. The sorrows would emerge in the city as pioneers of African commerce as they became suppliers to the residents of the new city. However, life in Port Harcourt was rough for many sorrow. Some came to the city as workers for British merchant houses and the colonial government. There was no job security and some sorrow workers retired without pension which led to much financial deprivation. The retired sorrow would begin asking to return home, and some were transported back with the help of colonial funds. The lack of growth and evolution faced by the immigrant Africans was partly as a result of a systematic wall enforced by the British. This began to occur because the sorrow in Lagos, Port Harcourt, and Abeokuta had earned the irritation of Europeans because of their achievement in the clergy and business world. The Europeans did not expect the Sorrow communities to excel in the way that they did, which made them feel like they lacked control over the colony. The Sorrow no longer wanted to be micromanaged by the colonizers and were tired of interference within their daily affairs. This would lead to the Sorrow beginning to rebel against their British overseers. Before we wrap things up, let's do a quick review to make everything come full circle. The Sorrow people formed from two liberated African groups, the first group predominantly came from the Nigerians who were illegally captured by the Portuguese and Spanish slave raiders after the Anti-Slavery Act of 1807. While this group was en route from the African coast towards Brazil and Cuba, the British West African squadron intercepted the illegal slave ships and resettled the Yoruba captives in Sierra Leone. This process of rescuing and resettling would continue until the early 1870s when the last wave occurred. The second group came from Nigerians who were captured by the Portuguese and Spanish, but these slave ships were able to successfully evade the British squadron and make the full voyage to Brazil and Cuba. After the Mali revolt of Brazil in 1835, they would begin deporting their former slaves back to Africa, but their first point of return was usually Sierra Leone. 
In the 1840s, both liberated African groups would begin migrating back to Nigeria from Sierra Leone and would form the Saro community. And since the Saro were the middlemen of the trade and missionary expansion between Sierra Leone and Nigeria, many Saro would go back and forth between countries. We must also remember that the first liberated African group, or those who had their ships intercepted, were settled in Sierra Leone for at least 20 to 30 years before the migration back to Nigeria began. So even though these Yoruba likely married amongst themselves, they also married into Sierra Leonean families as well. The children of both types of unions were born in Sierra Leone and typically spent their early years there before the migration back to Nigeria. So even after the migration, the Saros would still have family ties to Sierra Leone on top of their commercial ties. This back and forth would continue into the mid-1900s before beginning to decline. So for Sierra Leone, this is the reason why some Sierra Leoneans today have Yoruba first names, especially amongst the Creole people. Yoruba was also a contributor to some of the words used in the Creole language as well. The history I've explained is also the origin behind the Aku, locally known as the Four Bay people. They descend from the second group of liberated Africans who were deported to Sierra Leone from Brazil after the Mali Revolt. They are the direct descendants of the Yoruba who were converted to Islam by the traders from Mali in the 14th century, hundreds of years prior to their capture by the Portuguese and enslavement in Brazil. These Yoruba refer to Islam as Isani Male. So in Brazil, the Portuguese would refer to these Yoruba as Imale. They were the main antagonist in the revolt, hence the name. When they were resettled in Sierra Leone, they remained, and those who went to Nigeria would fully assimilate there or continue to go back and forth. For Nigeria, their connection to Sierra Leone is the origin behind Nigerian Pidgin, which is Nigeria's own form of broken English mixed with native languages. It was brought over by the Sauro community and their children. At least 95 to 98 percent of Nigerians have names indigenous to their tribe or region. But there is also a small percentage of Nigerians with English surnames, and this is a dead giveaway that their ancestors were Sauro people who came from Sierra Leone. Upon emancipation, most liberated Africans were registered with Christian names, but a large number of registries also listed African names based on information given by the liberated African or a translator. Many registries also record estimated age, height, brands, and body modifications. Some Creole families in Sierra Leone still remember and acknowledge their Yoruba ancestry, but the Saros who migrated back to Nigeria and settled would fully assimilate into Yoruba and Egbe communities over generations. And today, most descendants of Saros in Nigeria have no recollection or knowledge of this Sierra Leonean connection. Even those with English surnames usually can only think of slavery or colonial times as an explanation behind why they carry that family name, but most are unaware of their Sierra Leonean ancestors. This is the story of the liberated Africans of Nigeria who were illegally captured, rescued, and resettled in Sierra Leone, then made it back home to Nigeria. If you are a Creole born in the 1950s up to the early 1970s, you can go on FamilySearch.com and search the records of your parents or even yourself and find digital copies of birth certificates. Under their names, when identifying their ethnicity, many of them put liberated African descendant. If you can't find your own birth records, you can look up the records from your grandparents and great-grandparents born in the 1890s to the 1930s or 40s as well to see if you are a liberated African descendant of Sierra Leone. I was watching a video from Chief Fode Masare where they said, many roots, one fumble. In English, that means many roots, one family, and that can't be anything farther from the truth. To know thyself is to know your history. Omo Naija, Omo Salon. Peace and prosperity to both sides, and please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you.